And welcome to this glorious day. How are we all? Welcome to this glorious day. How are we all? That's a much more profound, robust thing. I'm glad to have that experience in that shape and that fullness with you, especially as we enter this time of worship, that season of ordinary time we talked about last week, right? That's the place where we hear things a little bit differently from Jesus. And I can tell you, they're just going to keep coming. He's got like these one-liners that sometimes we gloss over. And he's going to say things today that are going to make you uncomfortable. And I'm sorry, I can't do anything about that. I'm not the son of God. Right? So just know I'm prepping you for him to talk about the unforgivable sin today. Because there is one. And it leaves us uncomfortable when we read about it and we don't talk about it often. But it might not be what you think it is. So I give you that. And we're also going to listen to him talk about who is my mother and my brother and my sister because he's got some very interesting criteria around that today. So his words again, not mine. So with that, we come to this beautiful space to worship and we come asking the question, what does it mean to be mothers and brothers and sisters to one another and in the name of God? It is a beautiful experience to be here with you today as we dwell in this digging through scripture together and praising God. 
And with that, I turn it over to Mr. Brent as he leads us with the announcements. Thank you. Oof. Be sure to make sure you check your announcement sheet and take it home with you. Read carefully through all the announcements. There are a few items I'd like to draw your attention to. Uh, special thanks to Levina Nelson for sponsoring the radio broadcast today. And just a quick reminder that on Thursday, it will be the first summer youth group at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and then on Friday at 7 p.m., we'll have our first uh, installment of Fireside Faith in the South parking lot. Uh, please join us for games, songs, and an ice cream social as we celebrate life together as a community of faith. And with that, we can begin our worship service with gathering song, Made to Worship. You're able. Bless this place and these people, O God of manna, God of miracles, God of mercy, as we are gathered to hear your word, dwell in your peace, and partake in your life-giving presence. Amen. A mighty wind has blown, and tongues of fire have danced. The presence of the Spirit is with us, just as Jesus the Christ promised. The presence of the Spirit moves and gathers us into community. The Spirit moves us to lives of nurturing and challenging one another 
celebrating, and witnessing. Let us marvel at the power of God, God's power at work in and through us. God who freely gives of himself for our well-being. We confess the struggles we have to trust you, share what you provide, and learn from your teachings. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us. Empower us to follow the call of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen. By God's grace, you are saved. In the name of Christ, your sins are forgiven. The Spirit is upon you to live with the fruits of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Let us pray together. All powerful God, in Jesus Christ you turn death into life and defeat into victory. Increase our faith and trust in him that we may triumph over all evil in the strength of the same Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. This time, I invite the kids forward, and as they come up, sing Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Good morning. How are we today? Kenny, how are we today? Good. Are you guys having a good summer so far? Doing lots of fun things. Yes. <laughs> that sounds really fun. The pool is always a super fun place to go, isn't it? All right. I have a question for you guys. Who is in your family? Ryan? Sorry to hear that. They were part of your family, weren't they? Yeah. You're hanging on to dad pretty tight. Is dad part of your family? Yes. Is dad part of your family? Yes. Who do you think is part of God's family?
So you see all of these beautiful faces sitting out there looking at you? They're all part of God's family too. In our gospel story today, Jesus is with the disciples and they, he returned home and he had a crowd of people following him and they were not being very nice to Jesus and he was just trying to eat with his disciples and get away from them and have a little peace and they just kept following him and they were saying not nice things about him. And then his mom and his brother showed up and the people said that they were outside and Jesus said, well, yes, my mom and my brothers are outside, but the people who do the will of God are also my brothers and my mother and my sisters. And so all of these faces looking out there at you and looking back at you and in your family, being kind to other people, taking care of other people, loving on other people, doing the will of God makes us all part of God's family. Um, And all together, God sent Jesus into the world. He made a promise to save us, and we're saved through that bread and the wine that we get through communion. But there is a place for you here, too, as part of God's family, because Jesus loves all of us. And doing God's will and sharing his love and taking care of our neighbors makes all of us part of God's family. We don't have Sunday school today. We're off for the summer, but we will be together again this fall. And that is our good news for today. Can you say a word of thanks and praise to God with me? Can we say a prayer? Can you fold our hands? Dear God, God. thank you for Jesus, who helps us us to know your love love and reminds us us to help take care care of our neighbors in the world. world. Amen. Before you return to your seats, today is the second Sunday of the month, so we are going to collect some noisy offering this morning. Can you help me with that? Yeah. Can I give you a bucket? I didn't either, buddy. We're all kind of tired today, I think. Okay, Kenny, can I send you over on that side? Can you guys go together? Ella, can you go down this side here? And Emma, can you go down that side there? And then Brahm and Brian? Can you go way out on that side? There you go. Our noisy offering today goes to our South Dakota companion synods in Cameroon and Nicaragua. What's that? Yes, it does. Sound differently than us, and they eat different foods, and they talk a different language. When they're busy doing the work of God, we support them. And we celebrate with them because they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. So we're honored to be able to help them today, aren't we, Miss Sandra? Is that the last bucket? Oh, my. Can you put it on top there? Thank you very much. Yes, dear. Our first reading is from Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And then the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, 
The woman whom you gave to, me, to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put an enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Today our psalm is 130 and we'll read it responsively. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For the Lord there is steadfast love. With him is great power to redeem. It is he who redeemed Israel from all its iniquities. Our second verse is from 2 Corinthians chapters 4 and 5. Just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, even though our outer, nat outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight moment momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what, we can, not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For you know, we know that in the earthly tent we live in, is, it, live in is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Today's lessons, I just wanted to do a quick check with you. And we're only in Mark chapter 3, but so much has already happened in the first two chapters. We need to kind of catch up to ourselves. Jesus, he's been growing his fan base. He has groupies. Did you know Jesus had groupies? They're people who followed him all over the place. He has finally appointed his 12 mentees, we call the disciples. And the system, both the political and the religious, are watching him and they are upset. So what we're going to hear in the second half of chapter 3 is a curious reveal, which cannot be read in a traditional way because of its literary style. There is a large theme that's going to connect all of these segments you hear today together. You will how, hear how large his following has become. It is so large that it presses in on him and they can't even eat. Think about how many people that is in his house that are clamoring to see him. You will hear a reference to his deep passion. You will hear the beginning of a fantastic smear campaign to shut him down. You will hear about the one and only unforgivable sin, and all of these things will be sandwiched right between the idea of family. Family starts and family ends the segment. Begging the question, who is family? Who is a brother or sister or a mother? And a larger question, what is a covenant relationship? Oh, and when we get to the world, Beelzebul, Note here, Beelzebub is a Philistine god, not a Jewish 
the Jewish God, right? Which means Lord of the flies or Lord over dung or Lord of the dead. And the idea of Satan you're going to hear about today is not how we understand Satan. Christians in modern history, modern times, don't think of Satan in the same way. Okay? Our life got introduced into this thing called Dante's Inferno, which really changed how we think about hell and death and who Satan is. But they didn't have that. So be careful what images you're imposing on this character Satan when you hear the word today. So with that, we turn to the gospel because there is a lot to unpack today. To Mark, the third chapter, glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went home, and the crowd came together again so that Jesus and the disciples could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for the people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebul. And by the ruler of demon, he casts out demons. And he called to them and said, and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then, indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven of their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit can never be forgiven, but is guilty of eternal sin. And for, for they had said... He has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brother came, standing outside. They sent to him and called him. 
a crowd was sitting around him. And they said to him, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, who are my mothers and brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mothers and brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. This is the gospel of the Lord. I invite you to be seated. Like I warned you up front, this text wasn't going to be comfortable. You needed a little bit of praying. Living in the ordinary, everyday life isn't always comfortable, is it? Thank you for acknowledging me. It's not. It isn't. It really isn't. So, we begin with this phrase, who has heard the words, blood is thicker than water? A lot of head affirmations going on there. This phrase goes back to the 12th century England, and it gives the impression that family relationships of blood are the priority. Blood is thicker than water, we say, as in, you're my mother's child, and it's ride or die time, right? Right? I've got your back because you're just my sibling, you know. But there is some argument about the authenticity of the phrase. In Arabic nations, which is where, you know, much closer to Jerusalem than England, uh, in Arabic nations, blood is not about DNA. It's about the relationship you share from your mother's chest. But then it has been escalated in Arabic nations to be more about the spilling of blood together, protecting your clan. Blood is about the bond you make with the group, like a tribe or a gang. In 1980s, however, author Albert Jack and the messianic rabbi Richard Pustelanak, considering the Arabic context, challenge the original meaning of the expression and suggest that the original phrase was manipulated and should read the blood of the covenant is thicker than water of the womb. Did you get that? Blood of the covenant is thicker than water of the womb. That wording shifts the meaning quite dramatically, identifying loyalty as covenant relationships you agree to support, not people who share your DNA. The blood of the covenant is thicker than water of the womb. I think this phrase is at the center of Jesus' words to us today. He is questioning the idea of loyalty. To whom do you have loyalty, and where do those loyalties lie And how do those loyalties even begin? Jesus has been out doing his things. The crowds are getting bigger. As you heard, they're pressing in on him. There's so many of them, he can't even eat. He's been preaching good news. And he's restoring people who have pain, who are ill. The man with the withered hand. He has cast out demons by Mark chapter 3. He's pointing them to the Father. They rush him to get another piece of him because he's speaking a truth. You are forgiven, turn toward God. And this is causing panic. Two kinds of panic, to be precise. There's good panic. We want more, so they bring more sick. And now he's so profound in his speaking that it isn't just a matter of seeing a demonic person. The demons are actually throwing themselves at his feet. You're the son of God. Like, they're acknowledging him by this point. And he's called 12 people to learn from him. And then there's some bad panic. He has done numerous things polity and the law do not agree with, that conversation about eating on the Sabbath. And they seek a way to accuse him. And gossip is like a raging wildfire. He is out of his mind. 
Surely he has Beelzebul. That's why he can cast out demons. The slander campaign fitting of a political election. Am I wrong? No. No wonder his family is coming to restrain them, him. But it never says why. So it makes you wonder, are they coming to restrain him because he's angry? Because he's frustrated with the lies? Or are they coming to try to restrain him because they want to stop him so he isn't arrested? But the slander goes on, calling him Lord of the Flies, Lord of the Dung Heap, Lord of Demons, associating him with a pagan god? Ah, oh, talk about offensive. And in the midst of it, he calls out a statement most Americans attribute to Abraham Lincoln. Think about it. A house divided against itself cannot stand. How can I be of Satan? I would be conspiring against myself. And then he goes on to really hammer home his position. Say what you want to say about me, but if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, if you take what is holy and call it evil, you will not be forgiven. And with that, the tipping point has been reached and an unspoken climax has been claimed. Are you a covenant person? A person who is more interested or a person who is more interested in keeping loyalties to something besides a relationship with God. Now you could say to me, Pastor, you are taking loyalties with a story I don't agree with. And if you doubt, just keep reading. Because Jesus gives us confirmation in the next line. Remember, his mother and brother were coming to restrain him. They finally show up, and the people around say, Hey, Jesus, your family is here. And Jesus says, They're not my mothers and brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my mother and brother and sister. Whoa. Can you imagine the main pain Mary felt? I nursed you. Ouch. He's questioning the loyalty of his own DNA family who had different intentions than he did that day. So they were not there to do the work of God. So mom, whose side are you on? Jesus has drawn a line in the sand. This is what it looks like to be in my clan. This is what it looks like to be in my tribe. And notice that tribe got extended to include women. And trying to gain recognition or favor because of water of the womb relationships, that's no bueno. As it reveals who your first loyalties are to. Oh, how hard this is, especially for us in our current society where who you know gets you places. Name dropping is a real thing, and people use it all of the time. It gets us job interviews. It makes us preferable connections. It gets us special favors. I know such and such. Name dropping is actually a real art for survival in humanity. If you have moved around as much as my husband and I have moved around, you will know that until you get the right names, you don't get the right job, you can't move in the right circles, you can't participate in life until you make those social connections. It's just true. And without them, you're isolated. And Jesus is saying no to that kind of behavior. With me, it's about relationship and doing the work of God. There was an interesting moment this week when I engaged in a conversation about a wedding that a person, a non-member, wanted to have here at Zion. I acknowledged that I would, happy, I would be happy to do the wedding, but it would require premarital counseling where I would ask hard questions like, what will it mean to raise a family in faith? 
Where is God in the midst of your relationship? The phone call was quickly cut short, and I wondered what I had said and fretted that my clear, concise parameters around performing a letter were a wedding were too forward. I know I can be a little... I take this covenant thing serious, especially for marriages. The next day, however, I was confronted with the bride's cousin-to-be who came to talk to me. He was upset that I had spoken so rudely to his cousin and that I was not a welcoming person. Let me be clear. He was not part of the original phone call. He took gossip and made it his truth and was now accusing me with it. Not only that, she hadn't told him the whole story. She didn't affirm that I agreed to marry them. She only told him I made her feel bad because I asked about her faith in God. Hold that. I made her feel bad because I asked about her faith in God. This young man proceeded to tell me he expected me better because his grandparents used to go here. First name drop. And he said he had been confirmed here. Second name drop. He said he loved you all and he visited other churches now as he had his own way of doing faith. And he had no recollection of any commitment he had made at confirmation or desire to be an active part of this community. And with that, your pastor snapped. I was angry. I was listening to a person who said they loved God. I was listening to a person who said they loved this church, yet he gave me every reason not to show love. I said, you deny them the right of loving you back when you don't come into this room with them. I was listening to a person who only wanted to take, and when he didn't get what he wanted, he name-dropped. I was angry, and I would do it all over again because at the heart of the argument was the issue of honoring relationship with God in all circumstances. And we don't do weddings if God isn't at the center. We're church. And we don't do weddings if people can't claim their faith and desire for God to be in the middle of it because we're Christians. And we don't sacrifice that principle because of history, because of a name drop, because we're people of a covenant. And this young man was stating clearly with his words, I don't choose the covenant I am not going to do the work of God. I'm only here because my grandparents got married here, and this place should be more welcoming to allow my cousin, a non-member going to a Bible church, to be married here. And at some point, I looked at this young man, and I said, I do not marry the legacy of the past. I am here to marry relationships for the future that include God. What Jesus is saying to everyone, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, his mother, his brothers, and to us, your relationship with God, doing the work of the God as an expression of faith is essential. And it's so important that he will seal that covenant relationship with his own blood to marry us into relationship with God for our future well-being. So the next time someone says to you, blood is thicker than water, take a long, hard pause. Because that is a relationship for the ages that we're talking about. And all Jesus is asking of us is to respond, to get busy working alongside our mothers and our brothers and our sisters in Christ, to honor the commitments we make, working as a team to do the work of God. This is a pill to swallow today, folks. I'm sorry, but he said it first. I'm just responsible for handling the message. 
He loves humanity so much that he did something that required the cost of his life for us. It costs God something. It wasn't a name drop. It was his being for us. And that's what he's asking in return. Be here for me back. Covenant relationships, that's the tribe we're living in. That's the tribe we claim. That's the tribe we're baptized into. And when we come here and we say, fill me up, Jesus, make me, heal me, let me be, let me go as part of your tribe. So today, good people of Zion Lutheran Church, I would like you to look at your neighbor, look at your neighbors, and say, thank you for being part of my tribe. Come on, ladies. Thank you for having my back. Come on, thank you for having my back. Thank you for being someone I can depend on. Because you are a child of God with me. Amen. Please stand. 
God has made us His people through our baptism into Christ, living together in trust and hope. We confess our faith. (laughs) I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please stand down. Thanks. We come before the triune God to pray for our communities, ourselves, and our world. Come here, buddy. You reawaken our hearts to your mercy. We give thanks for renewers of the church in every age, enliven the creativity and persistence of all seeking to transform the church into a closer vision of your beloved community. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Your presence is revealed in the shade of trees, the growth of seeds into flowers, and in the blessings of plants granting food in their right season. Heal land scarred by deforestation, pollution, or infestation. Teach us to cultivate the earth with respect and reverence. Merciful God. Our nations and communities are divided, O God. Teach us again to listen with curiosity of with curiosity and mercy. Even in disagreement. Grant us the humility to acknowledge our hardness of heart and make us bold in modeling cooperation for the sake of the common good. Merciful God. Hear the prayers of all who cry out to you from the depths of fear, despair, or hopelessness. Especially Lois, Lyle, Gwen, Joyce, Janice, Shirley, Kathy, Barb, Jerry, Alyssa, Ken, Norma, Esther, Sharon, Sandra, Joy, Sharon, and Dennis. With haste, rescue victims of trafficking, exploitation, and abuse, and bless organizations, and individuals who work on their behalf. Merciful God. Grant wisdom and clarity to all who are in seasons of discernment and transition, high school graduates preparing for first jobs or new educational journeys, those who are shifting careers, and those who are navigating changes in their relationships. Accompany them with your peace. Merciful God. Receive our prayers, O God, and come quickly to our aid through the power of the Spirit and the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us take a moment to share a sign of God's peace with one another. That was the best sermon. as the ushers come forward to come get the ushering plates um, or the offering plates, I invite you to be seated. Um, If you didn't, I know Brent was playing, praying, but that was the best sermon. That's what Jesus is talking about. Because if you could have seen what I saw, (coughs) he was on his toes the entire Apostles' Creed looking over the table. Like, right? That's the hunger He's saying, little children, 
All of you wonderful, beautiful little children, come be hungry for me. Hold it up high. Let us pray together, Jesus, bread of life. You have set this table with your very self and called us to feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world to come. Amen. The Lord be with you all. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We come to the table of the Lord called by the Holy Spirit. We come to the table as a community, one body with many members. We come to the table hungry for the bread of life. We come to the table for healing. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus, he took bread and he gave thanks. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, in the same way, he took the cup and he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Gathered together by the work of the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I invite the community to be seated. As we come to the table, we know that we are merely hosts of God's goodness. This is God's covenant promise for us. We come under that thickness of the blood that was shared to receive his nourishment, to go into the world and share that good news. Whether you're here today or listening at home on Facebook or through the radio, know this promise is for you. And we are thankful that you come and be part of community here. Amen. As you come forward, if you need gluten-free, Know that it will be available for you 
if you need uh, the element, the sacrament in the form of grape juice or apple juice, it's in the interior circle. Wine is on the exterior circle. This is the gifts of God for the people of God. And we say, come. And if you need gluten-free, just ask, please, and we will let you receive it. the King, come and live forever, life everlasting, and strength for today, taste the living water, and never thirst again, come just as you are. 
Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Let us pray together. Jesus, bread of life, we've received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in the meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. Just a brief note and reminder, um, we currently have a um, mission trip scheduled next summer already um, in June to Milwaukee. And this trip is going to be for anybody who is completing their seventh grade year and older. Um, we will be having a meeting after church in classrooms A and B for all the details, at least what we have available to you at this point in time. So if it's something that interests you if you want to travel with us to Milwaukee and do some service work um, come hear some of our ministry partners that we have the potential to work with um, some potential housing options that we have at this time um, and get a few more of those nuts and bolts details um, there's still a lot that's up in the air because that's a year away um, but I can fill you in on where we're at right now with our information so we can talk next steps moving into the future Nope, it is for anybody seventh grade completed and older. So it's for adults as well. So if you're interested, come find information. We're not asking for a solid commitment today. So come hear what we're doing, and then um, we'll get those details for you. And you can uh, make a decision on whether this trip is going to fit with um, what you'd like to do and how long you'd like to be gone from home and the ministry work that we're going to do. So, I don't know if you heard her very well, so I'm going to emphasize, all of you who are 7th grade and up, that means if you're 92, have an opportunity to go to Milwaukee for a mission trip next summer. Yay! So, that's what she's offering. If you're interested, find her. They'll have a meeting afterwards. So, yes. I ask you to stand for the final blessing. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen.
Go into the world as champions of gospel living. And we will.